This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1986, a bank vault in Hollywood, California was emptied by a cunning group of burglars. The bandits tunneled hundreds of feet underground and escaped with $2 million. The police call it the crime of the century. In 1982, a 46-year-old appliance repairman was brutally murdered. Three theories have surfaced. Was this seemingly ordinary father of four killed by angry drug runners or by vengeful crime bosses against whom his brother was called to testify? Or was it a crime of passion committed by a jealous husband? In 1982, seven-year-old Crystal Merslock drowned in a swimming pool accident. Crystal was clinically dead, but after 15 minutes, doctors brought her back to life. Crystal is one of millions of Americans who have undergone what psychologists call a near-death experience, an intriguing, mystifying phenomenon in which they describe a peaceful journey after death in which old friends lead them towards a white light. Proof of life after life, or simply a mass hallucination? p.m. Friday, June 6, 1986. An alarm sounded at the first interstate bank in Hollywood, California. A police patrol was dispatched to investigate. When they arrived, they found no evidence of a break-in. On Monday morning, bank employees arrived for work. It was business as usual. A few minutes later, when a bank officer opened up the vault, she made a shocking discovery. Incredibly, someone had tunneled 30 yards from under a nearby street, ending up precisely underneath the vault. Using hand tools, they patiently slice through the 18-inch thick steel reinforced concrete floor. Once inside, they made off with over $2 million in cash, jewelry, and rare coins. Detective Dennis Pagancop was assigned to the case. My initial feelings that morning when we first arrived at the scene was one of, uh, of awe. I realized the fact that uh, these suspects were excellent burglars. Uh, they would be extremely difficult to catch. Uh, they'd gone to a lot of work, and uh, it was awesome. We view this burglary in the city as, as the crime of the century as far as burglaries go. Uh, the, the method of attack and the, the fact they got $2 million plus, uh, their ingenuity. I had never seen a burglary like this, and 27 years. Let's work this one about 100 yards up. Underneath the streets of Los Angeles, a subterranean highway of storm drains exists. Detective Pagan Cop discovered that the burglars had used these drains to secretly travel to the bank, where they then could tunnel undetected to the vaults. I don't see any dirt yet. They dug 95 feet from the drain to the bank. The extraordinary tunnels were approximately three and a half feet wide by four and a half feet high, all dug by hand but finished with electric tools, a remarkable feat of precision engineering. 
The experts tell us that the type of tunnels they dug were very safe tunnels. The size of the tunnels, the shapes of the tunnels were extremely expertly done, and the contour of the tunnels were done as such to add extra strength and protection to those digging. Police searched underground in a three-mile radius of the bank, looking for signs of the robbers. When we concluded our investigation at First Interstate Bank, basically we were left with no clues at all. There was no physical evidence left. The suspects left us nothing to work with. And we were basically handcuffed. Police had run out of clues. It seemed as if the perfect crime had been committed. 14 months later, the daring bandits struck again. They must have known that their extraordinary tactics were known to the authorities, but that didn't deter them. What is more surprising, the tunneling burglars came within minutes of succeeding. On Saturday morning, August 22, 1987, the alarm system went off at a Bank of America in West Los Angeles. Police were called in to investigate. The assistant bank manager opened the vault. They discovered the vault had been broken into. Apparently, the burglars had fled while the robbery was in progress. On the floor, an 18-inch hole was cut through the concrete. When I got the phone call from the officer at the bank, and he explained to me a hole in the floor, all I could think of was they're back, they've done it again, and how much money did they get this time? Because they were interrupted, the thieves were only able to steal $90,000. They left behind their tools and some work clothes. Chisel. This is the diamond tip drill. The robbers also left an 18-inch core bit, a cutting tool used in construction to bore large holes through cement. This was purchased in the San Francisco Bay Area by a construction company using a fictitious name and address in San Diego, and they paid cash. So basically, we knew that it was probably a white male that purchased it, but no other information. There's a buildup of dirt on this side. Yeah. That's it. A lot of dirt. Again, detectives searched miles of storm drains for some clue as to the identity yeah, of the, the bandits. Approximately three miles from the, the bank, they found a four-wheel vehicle called a quad runner just inside a storm drain entrance. Detective Pagan Cop believes the tunnels were dug by just two men. Apparently, they used their vehicles to carry their heavy equipment underground. Their core bit and drill alone required a drill press that weighed in excess of 100 pounds. We came to the conclusion that the suspects were very close friends, uh, possibly army buddies, uh, able to work together for long periods of time in very confined areas, taking up three to six weeks probably to dig that one tunnel. Detective Pagan Cop also believes a third man was involved, since clearly the burglars must have been warned by someone outside the bank. Time to move. Cops? I don't know. I'm gonna go. In their escape, footprints indicated that the burglars ran through the tunnel, one barefoot, one in stocking feet. They abandoned one of their vehicles and apparently escaped on foot. For all of their labors, $90,000 must have been a disappointing reward. Of all the evidence we recovered, tools, ladders, uh, clothing, we, rec we had uh, developed no fingerprints whatsoever. The only fingerprint we developed was the, on the uh, quad runner itself. We got one latent print from that vehicle. That print has been run through and compared with all arrestees. Uh, and it's our opinion that this individual has never been arrested. Police again went underground, looking for more evidence. You know what that is? That's hollow, isn't it? Yeah, it's hollow. About a mile and a half from the Bank of America, they found another tunnel completely finished. This 102-foot tunnel ended beneath the Beverly Hills Bank, and the mounting boats for the drill were already in place under the vault. If they'd have been able to accomplish both burglaries that weekend, it's told to me by the people in the, in the banks, in the banking industry, that they probably would have gotten away with between 10 and uh, $20 million. 
police learned that the quad runner was purchased by a man using the name David Spaulding, his only known address a post office box in Hollywood. One or two people using this name apparently purchased five of these distinctive vehicles. Salespeople created two composites of the same man. He is a male Caucasian around 35 years of age. He's about six feet in height and rugged looking, as if used to outdoor labor. Next, the story of two people who've been pronounced clinically dead and brought back to life. The experience has profoundly changed their lives. The stories they tell may suggest what lies ahead after death. Seven years ago, on March the 13th, 1982, a seven-year-old girl named Crystal Merslock was attending a children's birthday party held at a local swimming pool. Though she had just recently learned to swim, Crystal felt comfortable in the water. We went into the pool, and we were just playing down at the, at the shallow end for a while. And then, I don't know why, but for some reason, I went up to the deep end where a group of boys pushed me in, but they didn't know it. And I just started swallowing water, gasping for air, trying to grab up to the top of the water. I couldn't get any air, and so I just fell unconscious. And then I was just in darkness. Breast sounds here, please. Let me have a guess. Have How are the breast sounds? Okay. Right Paramedics rushed Crystal to a local hospital where a team led by Dr. Melvin Morris feverishly worked to save her life. When she came in, her uh, pupils were fixed and dilated, uh, meaning that she probably had no brain activity. She had none of the normal uh, reflexes that we associate uh, with surviving. Uh, she had uh, uh, what's called a Glasgow coma score of three, uh, which very few people survive if they have uh, such a profound coma. She's not coming around. She's not coming around. I did not think that she would survive. Dr. Morris said that she was so close to death that to prepare yourself for her demise, that she could expire at any time, there wasn't uh, much chance given to her for prolonged life after that event. At 3.30 p.m., Crystal Merslock was clinically dead. 20 minutes later, she was brought back to life. During the period of time she was being revived, Crystal shared a common experience with thousands of other Americans, a near-death experience, or NDE. Almost without exception, these people describe a journey to a land of beautiful light, a trip accompanied by an overwhelming sense of well-being. Is this experience an hallucination or evidence of a life after death? As Crystal lay near death, she felt herself moving into darkness. Then her eyes opened and she beheld a wondrous sight. I didn't really know where I was. It's just, I looked up and I saw this bright light at the end of a tunnel. And there were colored bricks on the walls of the tunnel. The light kind of pulled me toward it. It was just the most loving light I've ever seen. And then I saw this lady. She came toward me really soft and really slow. She took my hand. She said, I'm Elizabeth, and I will help you. She just led me into the light and through the light and into heaven. I just felt that this was the place I wanted to be. Crystal sensed that she was floating over her body, observing the medical team as they attempted to save her life. When I was up there, I saw the doctors, they were working on me. They were sticking things up my arm and up my nose to help me breathe, and I didn't like it. 
That was one of the reasons I wanted to stay up there. But when I got to thinking about how I wouldn't be able to really hug my mom again or anybody I really loved, then I said, no, I want to go back. And then I was back in my body. I wasn't dead. It, I was still alive. There was still a part of me, like my soul, my spirit was still alive. I wasn't dead at all. For at least 20 minutes, Crystal was, for all intents and purposes, dead. Even after she was revived, the child was in a coma for three days. Fortunately, once she returned home, Crystal completely regained her health. Crystal had never met Dr. Morris, the man who saved her life. But when they were introduced, he seemed familiar. The last time I had seen her, she was profoundly comatose. She could not have been in a deeper coma and still be alive. And then I saw her in follow-up uh, two weeks later. I said, you know, hi, I'm Dr. Morris. You probably don't remember me, but I sure know you, Crystal, because I spent, you know, uh, a grueling four hours uh, trying to bring you back to life. And then she turned to her mother and said, well, no, I have seen him before. She stated that she remembered seeing me from the emergency room. She said, oh, yes, I met you. I saw you. You were putting something in my throat. You were working with my neck. And she scowled at him. I saw his face, and I knew him. It was just like I'd never seen him before, and I knew him. She also described other elements of her resuscitation. She described. Um, us pushing on her chest and putting various lines in her. Uh, she described that she, she told me, first uh, you worked on me in the emergency room, and then you took me to another room, you know, which was in fact true. And when you see a seven-year-old talk like that and say things like that, there is no reason for you not to believe it. You know it comes straight from the heart. Dr. Gabbard has studied these near-death experiences and believes they may be physical, not metaphysical phenomena. The near-death experience can be understood as deriving from a fundamental psychological need to deny the reality of death, because it's too horrible to face the prospect that when the body goes, that's it. It's very tempting, of course, to suppose that these experiences are explainable by some sort of physiological events or biochemical events going on in the brain at the point of death, or perhaps by psychological principles, that this is just wish fulfillment, that the mind is unable to accept final death, so makes up this beautiful fantasy. But in fact, when you carefully look at the reports, I think we've all concluded that something very different is going on. One reason for this is that the patients are able to tell us things about the resuscitation attempt that they wouldn't have any way of knowing. My own subjective feeling after 23 years of working with these patients is that I have no doubt whatsoever that they had a glimpse of the life hereafter. Crystal has been to a place where her friends and family have never gone. She is certain that this experience will stay with her the rest of her life. I have remembered this for seven years. I cannot forget it. It's always there. It's always been very real to me, and it's always very clear to me. When we return, the story of a man who may have passed through death to the other side. Today his life has been transformed. He believes that life after death is a very real possibility. Many thousands of people have died and lived to tell the tale. An overwhelming number described the same phenomenon, a tunnel of light and a sense of floating over their body. One of the strangest stories connected with a near-death experience is told by a New York man named Thomas Sawyer. Ten years ago, his life was transformed by an accident that occurred in his garage. Today, Tom Sawyer is literally a new man.
Tom Sawyer lives in upstate New York and works as a snowplow operator. For 33 years, he lived a normal, uneventful life. <laughs> I'd have to describe myself as uh, pretty much an all-American boy. Uh, you know, with a name like Tom Sawyer, you have one of two choices. You can become a comedian or an uh, outgoing or end up being an introvert. Tom turned to athletics during high school, and that propelled him to popularity. However, his academic record was lackluster, for good reason. From seventh grade in grammar school, right through age 33, I never read a book cover to cover. Uh, I just disliked reading immensely, and I read nothing. In his late teens, Tom raced bicycles, and in 1968 qualified for the Olympic team. In 1967, he married Elaine, and they had two sons, Tim and Todd. Tom was a family man, a blue-collar worker who prided himself on his practicality. Prior to this experience, I had thought about such things as religion and so on, and I thought that it was just a bunch of foolishness. I would describe myself as an agnostic. What I had figured out was that when you die, you die, the show is over, everything goes black, and that's it. Bring the whole box and sort some of the tools out. Hand me the needle nose pliers. When I had this experience, I was repairing my pickup truck. I had the front wheels off it yeah, and was lying on my back, and the truck suddenly started to move. Oh my God! Dick! When Todd ran in and made the phone call, I heard it very clearly and vividly. Hello? My name is Todd Now, Sawyer. there were uh, other things that I was able drive. to hear that were impossible for me to hear with my ears and others with my normal hearing such as the conversation of the paramedics getting into the ambulance three and a half miles away. His wife's screams brought the neighbors, and they worked desperately to free him. One, two, three! As I went unconscious, I uh, then experienced a sensation or a feeling of absolutely waking up. It wasn't anything at all like waking up from a sleep state. It was like being unconscious or absolutely asleep, and then like a click of the fingernail, absolutely awake. The only problem with this feeling of waking up was that all I saw was darkness. That darkness gradually took the shape of a tunnel, and way off, absolutely positively to infinity, appeared this little speck of white light. This was the most beautiful thing that I'd ever experienced in my life. It was just extraordinary. All the pressure of the truck being on me and the horrendous pain, that was gone, and I felt very comfortable. The next thing that I realized was that I was motionless at the end of the tunnel, confronted by the light of God. I was confronted by heaven. That light included absolutely everything. It was the entire universe. It was absolute total knowledge. I had the opportunity to ask any question at all, and the absolute unequivocal correct answer would be emanated to me. I then experienced a complete total life review. It was every day, every event, every minute and second, in other words, I relived the Olympic trials, my marriage, all of these things at the same time. I was then given a choice to return to normal life or stay and become part of this light. I chose to stay and become part of that light, but I then had a feeling of going exactly reversal through the tunnel and slamming back into my body. Finally, as paramedics arrived, the truck was lifted off, and Sawyer was taken to the hospital. Be all right, Tom. Three, one, two, three. Well, I'm probably the only one you'll ever meet that's been kicked out of heaven, because since I chose to stay and become part of that light, and I am back here without any explanation at all, one of the logical, deductive things that you could assume was that I got kicked out for some reason or another. Surprisingly, Sawyer left the hospital the same day of his accident. He had no broken bones, though he suffered from some internal bleeding. According to medical reports, Tom had been deprived of oxygen for 15 minutes. 
I vaguely recall the ride home. I was in extreme pain, of course, and I was just sitting in the back seat by myself, moaning and groaning from the pain. Uh, but apparently, when I was riding home, all of a sudden, I blurted out and said, Oh, it was so beautiful. And Elaine turned around and said, What was so beautiful? What are you talking about? Well, I didn't answer her at all, and I just continued to moan and groan for the rest of the ride home. Elaine said to me, Don't you know what's happened? Don't you know what you've had? That's called a near-death experience. Whereupon my response was, well, I don't believe in any of that hocus-pocus baloney. But shortly after I recuperated from the injuries from this accident, I started saying things that I didn't understand and my wife Elaine didn't understand. And one particular day, I was watching television and I kind of blurted out, Max Plank. Plank, and I said it just like that. Who? Who's that? So, of course, I asked my family if they knew who that was. Well, I don't know either. And I Elaine said, no, I don't know who it is. And then she asked me, do you know who it is? And my answer was, well, no, but you'll be hearing more about him in the near future. I don't understand that. Elaine encouraged him to write down his thoughts. Tom began to jot down complex equations, equations that could only have been understood by a master of quantum physics. Tom also drew symbols, like the Greek letter psi. Sometimes I would write something down and know that it was correct, but have no idea what it was. In other words, I would write down a mathematical equation. Well, I had geometry and some algebra in high school, but this had symbols like triangles and things like that in. In an attempt to find out the meaning of these arcane symbols, Sawyer went to the Rochester Library. He was directed to the physics section and asked for guidance from a man he met at the stacks. Me, the man suggested a textbook that contained information on quantum physics and biographies of its pioneering founders. Well, yeah, I think possibly you might find this one interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. When I opened it, there were two things that stood out on that page. There was the symbol psi, in the middle of the paragraph, and there was a title just underneath a picture of a man, and it said Max Planck. The most common things we hear from people who have had near-death experiences are that they have a much greater sense now of being part of something larger than themselves. They become interested in what can be called the spiritual aspects of their lives. They are no longer invested in things like individual uh, fame, fortune, material rewards, competitiveness. They're much more involved in cooperation and helping others than they were before. He started being a more loving person. He started caring about myself and a lot of strangers, a lot of people he helped a lot. Anybody that needed help, he would help. These people have undergone profound and dramatic changes in their personality and their lifestyle and their values. All of them talk about the importance of interpersonal relationships, learning how to love others, a great sense of the importance of wisdom and understanding, and certainly a renewed appreciation of life. This is a genuine spiritual experience Good. which profoundly Good. and dramatically changes Here. the way they are from then on out. One of the real dangers of all the uh, attention the near-death experience is getting in the media is that it might romanticize death. It might lead people who are contemplating suicide to think that death is a wonderful experience. I suppose the near-death experience does romanticize death in that regard, but if you listen to what near-death experiences are saying, they're saying it also romanticizes life. It makes life so much more meaningful, more purposeful, more beautiful than it was before that suicide just becomes a, a, not an option anymore. People have asked me, if death is so wonderful and so sensational and you want to be part of that light, why don't you kill yourself? That's very important to me to state to everybody that suicide is an absolute impossibility for me. Uh, you know, it's not only a, a social and uh, legal no-no, it's a moral and spiritual no-no also to even think of or consider suicide. I think the way these people respond to the experience and the degree of change that they, they experience after it 
points to a tremendously powerful force. Uh, the types of changes they experience afterwards, the unusual abilities they have afterwards, point to something far greater than we're aware of now. Our usual explanations of the way the brain, the way the mind works in terms of physiology just don't explain what's going on. Something larger at work here than we're aware of yet. Are these strange journeys only a prelude to a life after death? Or are they hallucinations? Religions around the world have grappled with the metaphysical aspects of these questions, and scientists have tried to explain it in physical terms. Clearly death, and what comes after, is the most profound, unsolved mystery of them all. On a previous broadcast, we examine the story of Dan Willens, a mysterious prospector who spent his life searching for gold in the Canadian wilderness. We asked our audience to help locate his unknown heirs. In 1926, Willens was panning at Red Lake in the province of Ontario when he found gold. He and his partner staked their claim and established one of the most profitable small gold mines in Canadian history. In 1936, Dan Willen set out into the wilderness to do some solitary prospecting. He was never seen again. Willen's left behind an estate of almost $100,000, which today may be worth as much as three and a half million dollars. It has remained unclaimed for more than 50 years. Update. Within days of our broadcast, Davey Willens, a New York businessman, called our 800 number, claiming he might be one of the heirs to Dan Willens' fortune. My grandfather, we have determined, came from the UK to Ontario in 1895. At that time, he was 11 years of age. We believe he traveled with another family member. And we also have been told that there was a cousin someplace up in the outback of Ontario. But there was never any contact with that individual through the years. So when this Unsolved Mysteries program aired and this Dan Willens, a bushman from Ontario, was, was disclosed, it certainly was an exciting possible link for our family tree searching. Davy Willens flew to Toronto to meet Joe Perkins, one of Dan Willens' last surviving friends. He brought along photographs of his grandfather, Harold Willens, and his great-grandfather, John Willens, to see if there was a family resemblance. It was uncanny. I, I, the, the, I couldn't believe it. The similarity of the face, the nose, spacing of the eyes, forehead, and uh, I think if you took the beard off the old man, uh, they'd look like twins. Indeed, there does seem to be a strong resemblance. Our great-grandfather John, grandfather Harold, and prospector Dan Willens, all blood relatives, is Davy an heir to Dan Willens' fortune? Certainly money is important to everybody. And if the Ontario government is holding considerable assets that could rightfully be claimed by a Willens, then I'd like to see that happen. I don't know if it'll be me and my cousins or not, but maybe now we can get some Willenses to come forward and maybe we do have a strong case to be made. And certainly we are gonna take the next steps to pursue that possibility. In a moment, the story of a 46-year-old repairman who was brutally murdered in a quiet town in rural Ohio. Police have three bizarre theories, but no suspects. May the 23rd, 1982. In the small town of Hamersville, Ohio, a 15-year-old boy riding his parents' lawnmower back home after a mowing job made a terrible discovery. It was a man's body, nude and beaten. That night, the man would be identified as 46-year-old Perman Gilbert, an appliance repairman who lived just seven miles from the place his body was found. The most puzzling thing about Perman Gilbert's murder is that he appeared to those who knew him to lead such a normal, non-controversial life. Yet some believe that just beneath the comforting small-town facade, dark forces swirled. As the citizens of Claremont County, Ohio, discussed Perman Gilbert's murder, phrases like organized crime, drug trafficking, and jealous husband began to surface. 
Gilbert was a beloved husband and father of four. He and his family belonged to the Church of Christ and participated in the civic life of the rural Ohio County where they had lived their whole lives. Prem and Gilbert remained close to his siblings, especially his youngest brother, who was always in and out of trouble with the law. Perman's hobby was flying, but he was employed as an appliance repairman, assigned by a nationally known company as their troubleshooter. He worked for the large firm during the week, but on Saturdays, Perman made independent service calls, answering only to himself. When he left that Saturday morning, it was probably 8.30, and he said he didn't want to go. And it just, now it bothers me. I, uh, that's what I remember about him leaving that morning. Herman Gilbert's service appointments that Saturday morning took him to Mount Orab, Ohio, and also further south to Georgetown and Aberdeen, Ohio. Hi, Mr. Gilbert, how are you? Fine, just call me Perm. Perm, I keep smelling gas in my kitchen. I think it's my pilot light. Oh, Gilbert's okay, service okay. calls had put him at the southernmost tip of Ohio. When the calls were completed, he crossed the Simon Kenton Bridge into Maysville, Kentucky, and stopped in at a large market and variety store. Ann Breeze, who works at the market checkout counter, remembers his visit that Saturday. Hi, Ann. How are you today? Just fine. He was tall, a nice-looking man. He was always very neat. Greeted you, you know, very friendly every time you saw him. I never saw the man down or act like he had a care in the world. Are you going to have lunch with me today? No, oh, I can't have it. I guess I have to eat that bologna and cheese by myself. He would usually say that to me, and he knew that I wouldn't go to lunch with him. You. you know, just usual chit-chatter. When Perman left the market checkout counter, he walked into the flower shop next door. He pushed the buzzer, and I came from the back, and I asked if I could help him. He said he'd like to know if another employee was here, and I said, no, she doesn't come in until 4 and if I could help him anyway. And he said, no, he wanted to order some flowers, and they knew what he wanted and everything. And uh, he said he would come back later. She knows what I wanted. OK. Thank you. There was nothing unusual about him. He was just a normal customer. He wasn't nervous or anything when I, when I met him. No one can account for Prim and Gilbert's movements after he left the flower shop. He had told his wife he would be back home around 3 p.m did not arrive. Then it got to be dark, and he wasn't here. It got to be midnight, and I was scared. And I was afraid to go out, even. Uh, I had a small child, and I was afraid to put her in the car and go out looking. And um, then I think about 3 o'clock in the morning, I called one of our friends, and, you know, do you have you seen Perman? Uh, do you know where he's at? Anything like that. And they didn't. Joanne Gilbert called the police. They were unable to turn up any leads until late the next afternoon when her husband's body was found. He was completely nude. He didn't have any clothes on. That bothered me. I would like to know why that was done. Um, I've heard it's to humiliate the family. I don't know that that's why it was done. Maybe it was done to uh, make it longer to identify him. Because no cloth fibers were found in the two bullet wounds, Claremont County Police believe that Perman had been naked above the waist at the time he was shot. Perman's billfold carrying the symbol of the Masons was missing along with his clothes. So was the Masonic belt buckle he always wore. Although Perman's clothes were never found, his van was located the next day, 22 miles away from the spot where his body had been discovered. Herman Gilbert's watch was still hanging on the gear shift lever. His uh, tool box was in there. Parts and supplies was in place in the van. We did uh, uh, do an inspection of the van and recover fingerprints and hair samples. And at this time, we've not uh, been able to match the fingerprints and hair samples to anyone. In the investigation that followed Perman Gilbert's death, three theories evolved. I think that, that whatever happened to him had something to do with drugs. Perman was a licensed pilot, 
He owned a small plane, which he flew out of a makeshift landing strip on his farm. Uh, Perlman told me that uh, he had been approached to fly drugs. How's it going? OK. What's happening? Well, we have a little favor we'd like to do for it, if you don't mind. Yeah. It's just a little trip. And all he had to do was to uh, take the airplane and fly it to a certain airport, go and have a cup of coffee, come back out, and there would be money laying on the seat or under the seat. do with it, just forget it. It's good money. No, that's all right. If these guys don't quit bugging me, I'm going to call the authorities. And it would have been easy money, but uh, that's against the law, and it was against everything that we believed in. I believe that he knew too much about what was going on as far as who was involved with drugs and who wasn't because he would not go along with their plan that he was beaten and killed because of it. The second theory revolves around Perman Gilbert's youngest brother, Vernon. Vernon was 12 years younger than Perman, and they were devoted to one another. Are you sure you can't stay the night, then? No, I want to be getting back. In February of 1982, when Vernon was called to testify in an organized crime case, Perman stood by him. From there, okay. take a little while. It should be about an hour or so, OK? About an hour? OK, I'll be around. See you in an hour. Good luck to you. Thanks. The actual hearings were closed to the public, and Perman had to kill time while his brother was testifying. He began to suspect that he was being followed. Perman Gilbert had told acquaintances that he felt at the day at the federal court building that a man was following him around. Uh, I don't know of any person that might have been following Perman Gilbert, and it was not any of our personnel. Perhaps Perman Gilbert had become a target of organized crime. Maybe my husband knew too much. Maybe uh, Perman was killed to lure his brother back to the funeral, and because they were after him, really. And, uh, but then his brother didn't come to the funeral. The third theory is that Perman Gilbert may have been involved in a crime of passion. Oh, hi, Perm. Thanks hi. for coming over right away. Hi, sir, sir. How are you doing? What's her problem? Oh, the washing machine's making this grind. The very nature of Perman Gilbert's home appliance repair business placed him into many, many households alone with a family member. Uh, yes, I thought he was very attractive, and uh, I know other women were very attracted to him, too. He was tall, about 6'2", uh, well-built, had nice hair, pretty eyes, and a, a nice-looking man. I really didn't know about his death until someone from in his home area came through, said there was one or two theories, but one was that they thought a jealous boyfriend or husband had killed him. I feel that the crime of passion theory uh, doesn't hold up because uh, that's supposed to be something that's very swift, and they. Uh, beat around on him like someone was trying to get information out of him or something. What we need now is for someone to come forward and help us trace Perman Gilbert from that flower shop. Anyone that has seen him around the flower shop or in the parking lot with his cream and brown van at that time or later in the day, we'd like to hear from. And I feel like there are people out there in the community that know what happened to my father. And for fear of their own lives or other people, they're afraid to speak up. I wish that they would come forward and fill in those bits and pieces for us. Next week on Unsolved Mysteries, an examination of the legend of Billy the Kid that suggests history may have to be rewritten. Most historians and Hollywood screen versions claim that Billy was dramatically gunned down by his friend Sheriff Pat Garrett in 1881. But the people of tiny Heiko, Texas say that's all bunk. And that one of their own citizens, a man named Brushy Bill Roberts, was the real Billy the Kid. And that he died in 1950, 69 years after the famous gunfight. We'll examine the evidence next week on Unsolved Mysteries.
Thank you.